Well, after that wonderful talk, uh, we're going to have another one uh, by George Constantinidis. So we are very proud and grateful to Professor George Constantinidis for accepting our invitation to the CISTM annual conference, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Black Merton Scholes model. Professor Constantinidis has been a major figure in shaping modern finance, especially in asset pricing model. His contributions have had significant impacts on so many areas of finance in the past 40 years. His scholarly work has covered the historically observed premium of equity returns over bonds, the value premium, the size premium, the pricing and hedging of options, of course, quite appropriate and futures and other derivatives, especially focusing on transaction costs and taxes. He was one of the first people who actually looked at modeling term structure using sort of the modern approach of a stochastic discount factor and has led to a lot of research in that area. Personally, I benefited enormously from one of his papers on aggregation theorems and uh, that shaped sort of biennial research and publications in the area of finance. He's a former president of American Finance Association and of the Society of Financial Studies. George Consanidis is a research associate of National Bureau of Economic Research. He serves as a director and trustee of the Dimensional Fund Advisors, and Family Funds and Trusts. Please welcome George Consanidis from University of Chicago. George, as they say, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hossein. Um, I wish I were there to be in the group uh, uh, photo with Bob Merton. What I would do then, I would uh, uh, get my the picture signed by Bob Merton and uh, I would uh, sell it on eBay. No, I'm kidding. Of course, I would never part with that picture with Bob Merton. Anyway, um, it is a great honor to be invited to participate and contribute to the 50 year celebration of the path breaking option pricing theory of Fisher Black, Robert Merton, and Myron Scholes. My focus is on financial intermediation and looking ahead on future challenges. The precursor of the modern theory of the pricing of options is Louis Bachelier's 1900 doctoral thesis at the Sorbonne. Bachelier introduced the key assumptions that underlie the black scholes merton model and derived the first results outlined by um, uh, Stanley Klitschka in, 19, in 2010. Assume that the price fluctuations over small time intervals are independent of the present and past price level. Apply the central limit theorem to deduce that the price increments are independent and normally distributed so that price process, the price process is a Brownian motion as a diffusion limit of the random walk. Use the lack of memory property, the Markov property to derive the chapman kolmogorov equation. Establish the connection with the heat equation. Derive a simple formula for the price of at the money cost. Recognize the concept of arbitrage. Prior to the discovery in the 1950s of Bachelier's thesis by Jimmy Savage and Paul Samuelson, economists, including Paul Samuelson in 1965, struggled to determine the appropriate stock appreciation rate and the rate at which the expected payoff of an option should be discounted. Edward Thorpe and Shin Kasur set the stock's appreciation rate equal to the riskless interest rate and discounted the expected payoff of an option at the same rate, arriving at the BSM formula. They used the formula for pr profitable trading, but could not prove why it was cor correct. And there comes the Black, Merton, and, Merton and Scholes seminal theory that established solid foundations for the pricing of options and set off the 50 year revolution that we witness today. <clears throat> the risk neutral valuation of options was first introduced by Cox, John Cox and Stephen Ross in 1976 and further developed by John Cox, Stephen Ross 
and Mark Rubinstein in 1979. John Cox and Stephen Ross hypothesized, but did not prove, that for a wide variety of processes, the price of an option can be computed such that the expected returns for both the stock and the option are equal to the returns under the risk neutral rate. Harrison and Krebs in 1979 formalized the theory of risk neutral valuation implied by the absence of arbitrage. This is one of the most profound results in asset pricing. Nowadays, the theory is applied to the pricing of a wide spectrum of securities, including uh, fixed income securities. At the beginning, traders enthusiastically adopted the BS BMS model. They traded options according to the model and not surprisingly uh, found that the option prices nearly perfectly conform to the model. The first clouds appeared following the October 1987 stock market crash and the jump of the implied volatility of the S&P 500 index options. Most traders, including a trader that I had invited to talk to my class, um, continued using the BMS model and simply increased the volatility input, but perceptive traders made a lot of money by realizing that the BMS model needed to be modified, particularly in pricing out of the money puts. Fisher Black in 1989 highlighted the problem with the BMS model in the holes in black shows. A robust prediction of the BMS model is that the volatility implied by option prices is constant across strike prices. Mark Rubinstein in 1994 tested this prediction on the S&P 500 index options and the traded on the Chicago Board Options Exchange, an exchange that comes close to the dynamically complete and perfect market assumptions underlying the BMS model. From the start of the exchange trade based trading in April 1986, up until the October 1987 stock market crash, the implied volatility is a moderately downward sloping or U-shaped function of the strike, strike price, a pattern referred to as the volatility smile. Also observed in international markets and to a lesser extent in the prices of individual options, stock options. Following the crash, the volatility smile is typically more pronounced and downward sloping, often referred to as the volatility skew. Whereas downward sloping or U-shaped implied volatility curves are inconsistent with the BMS model, it is well understood that this pattern is not necessarily inconsistent with economic theory. The observed volatility smile or skew stimulated a voluminous empirical and theoretical amount of research on alternative models that are consistent with the data, notably by Stephen Heston in 1993. This research focused on stochastic volatility, price jumps, and volatility jumps. It is beyond the scope of the present essay to review this literature. Instead, I focus on my research on this topic and highlight directions for future research. Two fundamental assumptions of the BMS model are that the market is dynamically complete and frictionless. The theory on stochastic dominance is preference free and relaxes the assumption that the market is dynamically complete and frictionless. Stylianos, Perakis and I in 2002 derived bounds on the prices of options in the absence of stochastic dominance but in the presence of proportional transaction costs that are invariant to the allowed frequency of trading in bond and the stock over the life of the option. 
Potential violation of these bounds implies that traders, irrespective of their preferences, can increase their expected utility by engaging in a zero net cost trade. Jens Jackworth, Stylianos Peraitis and I, in 2009, empirically investigated whether the cross-section of one month S&P 500 index option prices from 1986 to 2006 are consistent with various economic models that explicitly allow for dynamically incomplete markets and also an imperfect market that recognizes trading costs and BDASK spreads. They documented widespread violations of stochastic dominance, even with generous transaction costs in trading the index and the options. They allowed the volatility of the index return to be state dependent and employed the estimated conditional volatility. Even though pre-crash option prices conform to the BMS model reasonably well, once the constant volatility input to the BSM um, formula is judiciously chosen, this does not speak on the rationality of option prices. The novel finding is that pre-crash options are incorrectly priced if the distribution of the index return is estimated from time series data, even with a variety of statistical adjustments. The interpretation of these results is that before the crash, option traders were extensively using the BMS pricing model and the dictates of this model were imposed on the option prices, even though these dictates were not necessarily consistent with the time series behavior of index uh, prices. There is substantial violation by out of the money costs under both the fixed and proportional transaction costs regimes. This observation is novel and contradicts the common inference drawn from the observed implied volatility smile that the problem primarily lies with the left hand tail of the index return distribution. The decrease in violations from the 1988 to 95 post-crash period is followed by substantial increase in violations from 1997 to 2003. This is a novel finding and casts doubts on the hypothesis that the options market is becoming more rational over time, particularly after the crash. Mikhail Cherwonko, Jens Jackworth, Stylianos Peraitis, and I, in 2011, confirmed these results with out-of-sample tests on options on the S&P index futures. Jens Jackworth, Alexis Savo, and I, in 2013, suggested that the three pharma French factors are, and related factors used to adjust stock returns or risk may not capture factors appropriate for adjusting option returns. They created three factors from the S&P 500 index options that capture stochastic volatility, price jumps, and volatility jumps. They did not reject the hypothesis that any of these factors combined with the market factor explains index option returns, except for the returns on short dated out of the money puts. However, the combination of the volatility jump factor and the liquidity factor by Lubos Pastor and Robert Stambaum explains away the abnormal returns of all option portfolios, including the returns of short dated out of the money puts. Even though the liquidity factor was designed to address stock returns, it is remarkable that it plays a major role in explaining option returns as well. I further address the importance of liquidity and intermediary asset pricing shortly. Michael Cherwonko, Stylianos Peraitis, and I, in 2020, 
upset the above resolution of abnormal returns, they reported that portfolios of the S&P 500 index bonds and index options dominate portfolios without index options. The portfolios with options include primarily short calls and are particularly profitable when maturity is short and volatility is high. Similar results obtained for the DAX and uh, CAC index options. Neither price factors nor a non-monotonic stochastic discount factor explains these results. David Bates emphasized that price factors cannot fully capture, much less explain, the empirical properties of option prices and concluded that there is a need for a new approach to pricing derivatives that focuses on the financial intermediation of the underlying risks by option market traders. And that was a very wise early insight by David Bates. A substantial amount of economic research focuses on financial intermediation and the capital constraints of intermediaries. A leading example is Zingo He and Arvind Krishnamurthy's 2013 paper, who pointed out that traditional approaches to asset pricing ignore intermediation by assuming that intermediaries' actions reflect the preferences of their client investor. A parallel research developed in the option pricing literature that focuses on the supply and demand for options and the role played by market makers, including hedge funds. Nicholas Bolen and Robert Whaley in 2004 examined the relation between the net buying pressure of index options and found that the implied volatility of index options is directly related to the buying pressure of index puts, particularly out of the money puts. Nikolai Garleanu, Lasse Peterson, and Alan Podesman in 2009 introduced the demand pressure hypothesis where supply shifts in options by market makers are endogenous, while demand in options by customers is exogenous. They obtained explicit expressions for the effects of demand on option prices, provided empirical evidence consistent with the demand pressure hypothesis, and showed that demand pressure effects can play a role in resolving the main option pricing puzzles. The equilibrium net buy equals the exogenous customer demand, and the paper does not provide testable implications regarding the net buying response to risk and option prices. Erko Etula in 2013 modeled a commodities market with risk averse producers and consumers and rare risk neutral uh, broker dealers who are subject to a value at risk constraint and found empirical support for the prediction that the broker dealers risk bearing capacity forecasts energy returns. Dmitry Murayev 2016 showed that inventory risk faced by market makers has a first order effect on option order flow and option prices. Um, Hui Chen, Scott Jocelyn and Sophie Nee proxied the variation of the financial intermediaries constraint with the net buy of deep out of the money puts and showed that this measure explains the variant risk, variance risk premium embedded in puts and predicts the future excess returns of a variety of assets. Matthew Fournier and Chris Jacobs in 2020 modeled a market maker with limited capital and found that most of the variance risk premium for index options is due to inventory risk. 
Lei Lian and I, in 2021, modeled the endogenous demand shifts by customers in addition to the endogenous supply shifts by market makers in the market for S&P 500 put options. Therefore, they provided testable implications regarding the net buy response to risk and option prices, implications that are empirically verified. They modeled the supply of at the money and out of the money S&P 500 index put options by risk averse market makers and their demand by risk averse customers who hold the index and the risk free asset and buy puts as downside risk protection. In equilibrium, market makers are net sellers and customers are net buyers of index puts. The model implies that when the risk increases, the supply curve by market makers shift to the left and the demand curve by customers shifts to the right. It turns out that the shift to the left of the supply curve dominates the shift to the right of the demand curve and the net buy of put by, puts by customers is decreasing in the risk. This prediction is verified in the time series of the net buy of at the money and out of the money puts. This highlights the importance of considering the endogenous response of both the demand by customers and the supply by market makers. There is more, much more to be done in exploring the financial intermediation of options. For example, there is no identifiable empirical pattern in the net buy of costs, and this needs to be further investigated. I suspect that we need to allow for customer clientele for cost and puts of different moneyness and moneyness to provide a richer theory of the demand and supply of options. Overall, I have identified the important role of financial intermediation in understanding the pricing and supply and demand of options. Much exciting research lies ahead. Thank you very much. And I allowed for a lot of time uh, for discussion and uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Professor Kansanis. I'm gonna see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Yes. Can you hear me, George? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to ask, there's a lot of research done on valuation, valuation of options and all of that. And you uh, pointed to some papers on returns on options and that pharma and French factors cannot really capture that. So yes. where, where is that research stream going? Because I'm very interested in that research stream. Uh, there's 20, in, in market value, there's about 20 trillion at least of derivatives in the world. If you look at 100 trillion bonds, 80 trillion stocks, whatever. So it's a sizable amount and we need to understand returns. And uh, so I don't know your thoughts on that, and where that research is headed. Return, returns on derivatives, not just valuation. Uh, I, I did not... Uh, your, your voice was breaking, so based on what I understood, uh, you're asking what can explain the returns on options. Uh, yeah, the, pharma, the, the three factor and the five factor pharma French models sort of were designed to address the cross section of equity returns. So they do not do much of anything in explaining the cross section of option returns. And by that, I mean the most highly traded uh, S&P 500 index options by and by cross-section means looking at different moneyness for calls, for puts, and also for different a, a range of maturities. So we found that you have, one has to uh, introduce uh, uh, a different set of factors in addressing this cross-section. 
And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the three uh, factors that are very important is the uh, volatility, uh, the jump, and the volatility jump factors. And explain almost everything except for the short dated out of the money put, uh, something for which surprisingly we need the uh, 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 Pastor and Stambau uh, liquidity factor. So I'm not sure if I addressed your question. Please speak closer to the microphone. So as a follow-up on that, I want to ask these three factors that explain option returns. Yes. Into explaining stock returns. For example, pharma print do such a good job, can they beat pharma French factors in explaining stocks as well? I mean, at the end of the day, stocks are also like options for corporations. So is there something we found that is better than pharma French by looking into factors for options? Yeah, well, I, the, uh, the under perfect markets, the surprising result is, uh, first of all, the same set of fraction, uh, factors that explains stock returns should explain option returns based on uh, the uh, complete market's assumption and the assumptions of the Black Merton shows. But you find that they are not. The uh, pharma French factors do not explain much of anything relating to the cross-section of the option returns. And the converse is true also. The uh, three option important factors do not explain much of anything about the stocks. And that leads me to think that the segmentation of this is due to the, uh, uh, the uh, what I talked about, the supply and demand uh, of options, which is um, different because they're intermediated through market, well, through market makers and uh, the forces and the considerations of these market makers do not affect the equities market. So in that sense, that's, that's another uh, uh, argument in favor of looking carefully at how uh, these uh, uh, stocks are traded versus how options are traded. And the considerations are different in affecting the trading of options than the trading of stocks. That's why the factors of the, of the one market do not uh, relate to the factors of the other market. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I have one. So uh, I think you mentioned that the, the, the impact of intermediaries and on pricing yeah. of options. Uh, been a couple a few research about what has happened since uh, global financial crisis that. Uh, for example, cover interest parity does not, not, not seem to be holding as well as before the, or pricing of interest swaps are being affected by that because of the capital requirements of yeah. banks. Yeah. What, what is the research in that area in affecting option prices? Are, are we seeing deviations from perhaps for more illiquid options? Uh, are, are there any evidence that, that capital requirements and so on has affected option prices? Well, I, I, I can only speak about index options, which is a very, very liquid market, unlike the stock options for which uh, the depth is not large and uh, uh, those are more illiquid. Um, so I only, I did not study the, the effect of SOPs, but I would expect that again, the, uh, the uh, swap desks are the, intermediaries in that market and that's uh, different than the intermediaries the, the market makers in the options market so i would expect that the swap market would be affected by a different set of uh, uh, considerations than the option markets it would be nice to have a, a universal theory uh, of uh, uh, market uh, makers but i don't think that's uh, Possible because we uh, those are very different markets by very different players, and I don't think I don't see a unified theory of uh, uh, market makers and uh, dealers. 
but something even more surprising, uh, the patterns we identified in the trading of at the money and out of the money puts, just to, to repeat, is when the uh, risk is higher, so there is a, a higher demand for puts for production, but lower supply by market makers, which are also risk averse. And uh, that is uh, implied by the theory and it's also found in, we found in the data. You would expect something corresponding to apply for cool calls, um, but we did not uh, find any uh, clean pattern in the data that we studied supplied by the CBOE. So I think that's very dependable data. We did not find any corresponding pattern for cost. So my suspicion is that sort of the clientele in put options may be different than the clientele in call options. So that's why uh, it uh, does not seem that we can uh, merge those two markets. All right. Any other thoughts or questions? All right. Well, oh, Sanjay is coming again. Well, uh, so if there's so much market segmentation between bonds and stocks, between calls and puts, between options and stocks, then are we not, should we not investigate a little bit more? Are there like huge short ratios available? If you can somehow combine, because options at the end of the day are derivatives of equities. And if there's so much market segmentation, then maybe you can produce some huge sharp ratios by some trading of options and underlying stocks. The factors are different. So is there some work? I know in finance research, we don't like to do so much, but there could be some great money making options with so much market segmentation. Um. Um, I am not aware of uh, someone putting all those markets, trading in all those markets together and generating these very high sharp ratios. Maybe it's possible. Um, uh, we have to also look at uh, uh, the uh, trading costs and the um, problems associated with uh, trading simultaneously on different uh, platforms. I mean, there is one area that I'm aware of. If you buy very short dated, short maturity options, you almost always lose a lot of money. And if you buy very short dated, short maturity options, uh, even call options, which was not the case. And call options actually, you should never lose so much money on, on call options because due to risk aversion, that should not happen. So already there is some evidence that, that there is a lot of money that can be made. You know, and some people do that. They just keep writing options, short dated, short maturity options. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, th there are these uh, things that cannot be, that I have not been able to explain. And uh, I'm not aware of uh, an explanation for them. And um, uh, I, I think. I think we only scratched the surface of uh, uh, intermediation. And uh, uh, I think that's where the answers should lie. As uh, David Bates said uh, very wisely, uh, just introducing more factors, making the time series process of, uh, of index, of the index sort of uh, adding more features to it. I don't think that's going to do it. I think we uh, we found what matters and that's uh, the stochastic volatility and the jumps are important and uh, uh, volatility jumps are important. But at the end of the day, I think we reached the limit of how much that uh, complete markets frictionless theory um, can uh, explain things. And we need to look more into uh, the details of how thing, things are traded are starting with the who are the intermediaries in these markets. So um, I'm glad that sort of that sort of generates a lot of interest. I think 
we should all follow more 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 uh, David Bates' uh, uh, great insight and uh, look more in more detail at uh, exactly how these uh, uh, options and and swaps and everything else are traded and who are the intermediaries and how do they act. Yes, I'll, I'll just say that one last thing and then I'll turn it over to Hussein. So we typically teach that whole market portfolio, whether it's S&P 500 or the world index, but if there's so much segmentation in the market and so much market incompleteness, then possibly you've got better portfolios than the market portfolio, which has like you could hold some treasury bonds and some call options, for example. Or you could mix and match certain things with derivatives and equities. And my feeling is that would produce much better shock ratios than just to go S&P 500. Well, uh, yes. I mean, the, the my uh, research with uh, uh, Perakis and Chewonko, we pointed out that uh, to a, a trader that trades only in the in treasury bills and uh, the market or the S&P 500 index, if we allow for the uh, trading of options, adding a, a zero cost portfolio that includes options can dominate the old portfolio. So dominate, so uh, produces a very high uh, sharp ratio. Uh, so that's possible, yes. And uh, now I think that, I, I think it is still an open area and uh, my the only thing I try I, I try to uh, achieve with this in my talk is to sort of uh, make a call for more interest in exactly how these financial instruments are traded, paying very uh, great great attention to the intermediation process. And I think there's a lot you don't understand. As I said, even. With the highly liquid uh, costs on the S&P 500, I, if you try to look for uh, uh, patterns of who trades, uh, uh, market makers, uh, large traders, small traders, uh, there is no, I could not detect a consistent pattern. And what pattern I could see would sort of change over time. So there is much more to understand, but I do not in that respect. And the fact that there seems to be some segmentation between uh, costs and puts, that's uh, kind of very uh, puzzling and challenging. We, we do not even need a specific model. We are talking about uh, uh, something that should obey the put call parity. And the, there are small violations there as well. That means we next 50 years of option pricing, they'll be as expected. <laughs> I'll turn it back to Hussein. All right, well, thank you very much, Professor George Kansadines. Lots of uh, uh, important thoughts about the future and where we have come from. Again, thank you so much for taking time and accepting our invitation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and I enjoyed your questions and comments. And with that, we're going to close our conference. Uh, again, thank you so much to Professor Robert Milton for taking time, uh, coming here and giving us really important uh, lesson about uh, retirement and retirement planning and products that actually could help it make it easier for average uh, Americans and everyone to save for retirement. And as I said, this was the second time that Professor Milton took time and attended our conference. We are very grateful and uh, safe travel back to Boston. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.